Next up is Benny Howard from Steris. Okay, I've learned a great deal this week. Um, listening to all of us in here in the exhibit hall, some of the other speakers in the R&D groups. And um, we, just like everybody else in, that are making products or using products, have experienced change and conflict that, that we never really worked into our systems. Um, we've seen amazing growth in what everybody does. And we've gotten resilient, everybody, in terms of solving problems. The one thing I didn't hear very many people mention is something that I always tell people when they're new in R&D. I want somebody, when they're having those first meetings, to have somebody in the back of the room go, hey, how are you going to sterilize that? So it's kind of appropriate that it's sort of the end of the, uh, the week that I'm going to actually talk to you about how you worry about some of these other bottlenecks in all your systems. Um, many of these single-use devices, single-use systems parts, they're going to have to be sterilized before they can be used and integrated into all these amazing processes. And as you put pressure, and as you've seen the pressure on everything else in um, development, there's also pressure on capacity to sterilize products. Now, um, Steris, um, I'm the Senior Radiation Sterilization Manager for Steris. We started many years ago, we have to project, project what everybody's going to need five years or more in advance. And as a result of that, we very heavily focused on where can we get more photon-based technologies to handle the diverse range of products and materials that we might have to um, sterilize. And we put an, um, a definite step forward and uh, efforts into expanding X-ray. Everybody's heard about X-ray. Everybody thinks in theory it's very nice, but everybody's still a little afraid of it because it's a little different. Um, they're very comfortable with gamma. We are too. Um, but what I want to do is give you some background information so you're looking at both technologies side by side, how they can be a way to cover any uh, gaps that might happen in the future, any potential risk of not having product when you need it, keeping that critical flow going forward. Um, I thank you all for being real resilient and hanging out this late on a Friday. Okay, okay my agenda. Um, I want to give you an overview because not everybody's, they, they, they hear about it, but they don't really know what it is. But I want to focus on the middle part of this uh, slide. There's actually three parts you, you, you think about. There's the stuff you really don't have to worry about when you're changing things, but you look at. There's the stuff that might have an impact, but usually relatively small. And then there's the stuff that you absolutely have to do. And we're going to look at all those. On the low risk profile of that is the dose that you validated. If you're validated in gamma, you've been running gamma to sterilize a product for years. That dose range you, you set up, min and max, do not need to change if you use x-ray. It's a good idea to show that that's true, but there is many, many publications that support that theory. It's not even theory, it's fact. Because in sterilization, you, in radiation sterilization, you set your dose based on bio burden, the type and the quantity, not on how you're gonna kill the bio burden. So the dose that you achieve will be the same regardless of which ionization uh, technology you use. Um, as we get farther into this, I want to actually focus on why you, you see so many people talking about x-ray all of a sudden. Um, it's not to destroy gamma. It's not for gamma to go away. We need gamma. We need capacity for all of the wondrous things that are coming out of healthcare. But there are pressures in the world that are, are showing us that the direction to go to expand, to give more capacity, is going to probably be an x-ray. And we have definitely, Steris has taken that step forward. Um, many of you will be familiar with gamma. A standard system usually has carrier bases in the United States. There are some worldwide that are running pallets. But in general, you have a radioactive source that's in a rack. It's in a um, big concrete bunker big pool of water underneath the floor, and once product is in there, the product ratchets step by step around the source until it's gotten the total accumulated dose that you requested. 
When they're not being used, the source rack would go down in the pool and it would sit there and do nothing, um, except it will still decay. And that's the, the limitation of uh, gamma. Because it's radioactive based, from the second it's produced, the cobalt-60 we use, it is decaying. Okay. X-ray looks nothing like that diagram I just showed you for gamma. It actually, if you're familiar with it, looks a lot more like an E-beam unit. There's a pronounced that um, on the right-hand side of that slide, you see that big thing sticking out with the yellow line on it? That looks as a scan horn. It's part of the system. It's the place where, in our case, the x-rays will uh, leave the system and then go into product. Um, it's by design. It is assembled and built as a, like an E-beam unit. There's electricity coming into it, into what they refer to that end, that top end of, as the electron gun. The electricity is interacting with the cathode. The cathode is creating electrons, so negatively charged species, that we're now in their vacuum, focusing, speeding up to darn near the speed of light. And then they're in a very concentrated beam that then is allowed or forced to oscillate back and forth over the distance of what you see there as a scan horn. The products can be conveyed past that scan horn. When they do that, they are now being ionized. They are only being ionized when they're in front of that scan horn. But because what we're creating in X-ray is now no longer charged species that we're gonna try to use, there's one more component to the system that is not in an E-beam unit. It's called a converter plate, and it's right at that interface as the electrons are trying to get out of the system. And it's a metal, a design metal, specific kinds of metals. In particular, we use tantalum. It has to be a, the right thickness and in the right position so that when the electrons hit it, they cannot get through it. Their energy is released into that plate, and what comes out no longer is a charged species but a photon. A photon be behavior that's created through electricity or a photon created through radioactivity is still a photon. And how it behaves, it's the same way. The difference will be how they're created. Okay? The key to x-ray is the systems that are coming online will be pallet irradiators. Um, at first, this did not seem like a big deal to me, but I've learned more and more from all of you people and from the people who use it that pallets are a really good idea. You have products that you're making or shipping, and they're very, they can be delicate. They have been packed in a way to protect them. You don't really want people messing up that pallet if you can avoid it. If you have a carrier system in gamma, they are taking those boxes off the pallet, putting them in the uh, carriers, and then putting them back on the pallet. Granted, they're not going to try to damage anything, but you, somebody went out of the way to be very, very deliberate to try to protect their product so in transit, in storage, it's protected. Now the pallet that you designed to do your product is what's going to go into the irradiator. The only limitation is it must be the pallet size made for the machine, and that's usually based on what, where in the world it is. So you can't take a European pallet, for example, and run it on an American machine. Um, similarities and differences. Some of these are um, um, very obvious at first, but their impact is not always understood. Um, the, the source of the photons is different. That one, one is radioactive, one is not. Oh, gosh. Here we go. We're going to make this easy on my eyes and easy on your patients. Um, the microbiological effectiveness of a photon is the microbiological effectiveness of a photon. It doesn't matter. That's why your dose does not change when you, you move, if you move from gamma to x-ray. Your verification dose, the one you use for dose audits and such, still does not change because they're both coming from vial burden numbers. The, um, the mode of action, how they kill organisms in your product, are the same. And the standards and guidelines that you follow to, to use gamma are the same ones you use for x-ray. But there are differences. And this is where you want to make sure you make assessments to assure yourself, assure anybody using it, that the differences do not impact the safety, the performance, or the effectiveness of your product. 
And some of them are rather minor differences, but they are different. And you always want to address those. Um, you have, they are different energy levels. They are, um, um, how they're created is different. The, but the, the dose that they're producing is the, the unit, kilogram is the same, but the rate at which you're creating them is different. The speed at which you're shooting those kilograms at your product are different. The exposure time will, of course, be different. If you're doing it faster, your exposure time will be shorter. And you're keeping it in the pallet instead of taking it out. This slide, I think, is the best educational slide I've ever seen comparing the two of them. Um, keep in mind, even if I run through these very quickly, you will have somewhere an access to these, either on the Steris AST um, uh, YouTube channel. You'll have my contact information, so I have them. And I believe you may be able to get them also through the organization you're here for. Okay, now looking side by side, this is probably the slide I'll spend the most time on. If you look at the bottom, where the blue arrows are, that blue bar is representative of the source rack in a gamma radiator. The second cobalt-60 is made, it is in the process of decay. We want that to happen. It creates photons, they come off that thing, that's the source rack, and now we have to present product to it so that we capture as many of those, which we did a lot of work to create, and make sure they go where we want them to into your product. But if you'll notice the directionality of all those arrows, the source rack does not know where your product is. The decay of the cobalt doesn't care where your product is. It's shooting off photons in every physical direction it could. We use as much of that, um, what we see there, as possible by moving your product around the source in a very deliberate pattern. In e-beam, oh, the other one is at the top of the slide. I left the important part out. Um, when cobalt decays, it creates two different energy level photons, one at 1.17 MeV, one at 1.33 MeV, average of 1.25. That's important to remember that the energy coming off that is only 1.25. Plenty to kill things, but it doesn't cause some other issues that we're going to talk about later. In X-ray, you are working with energies of around 7.5 MeV. But what the product is seeing is more variable. That's why that curve is much wider. Most of the photons that come off that system will be much lower in energy than the gamma ones were. But there will be some percentage of that output that will be closer to the output of the energy of the system, so closer to that seven. They also are coming off of that, that um, scan horn which means they're no longer isotropic. They're not moving in every direction. They're going in the direction in which they were created, which is the direction the electrons were created. So when your product is passing by the scan horn, that directionality, as many as possible of the photons that are created are going right at your product. We don't have to go around the source, but we can do multiple passes to improve the depth of penetration. Um, overall, just what you're seeing, a lot of the terminology and the explanation of what you see every day, you're always comparing to either E-beam or gamma. Um, it's sort of in the middle, if you start thinking about it. It's X-ray starts out as an E-beam. It's generated like an E-beam. Um, the electrons are accelerated like an E-beam. But eventually, they hit that plate, that converter plate, and what comes through the system that will hit a product will be a photon. All of the ways we created the electrons, we did them the same way. Now that comes through, because it's coming through as a photon, I want you to look at those pictures on the right. The scan horns looked about the same, right? The electrons are coming through. But what in the E-beam system is happening is the electrons are actually hitting the product. X-ray, what's hitting the product is photons, and the thing you should notice immediately is how big that stack of product is. E-beam has limitations with, with penetration because of the charge. In X-ray or gamma, they're photons, they're gonna have very deep penetrations. So that's why we can process full pallets. 
Um, there are many publications that support a lot of the things that are most important in sterilization. One, the effectiveness of dose. In this, these series of slides, there are many references to um, guidance articles. All of the contacts and the information for them are in here. So at some point, you do want these slides. But if you read through all of this, all the papers say the same thing. Bottom line, bio burden is what's the basis of setting your dose, not where the ionization, electric, ionization came from. Add on top of that, that when you start ionizing something, anything that's hit with ionizing radiation also ionizes. What happens when it ionizes? It cr creates some more electrons. Those electrons hit something else internally to your product, and if you think of what's happening, you're just taking energy and you're spreading it all the way through your stack of product. So in reality, you have the, the incoming energy, but you also have all the secondary electrons. Combined together, these kinds of systems give great uniformity of dose. Um, penetration, the yellow line is the E-beam. We're not talking about that today. Works great for some things. You can also depends how you present the products to the source. But the X-ray and the gamma are going to be very, very similar in penetration. They all kill the same way. They, tr they do things to biological molecules that make them unable to do what they're needed to do. DNA is the best example. If your DNA is damaged, you don't have the ability to reproduce it, which means you can't reproduce the living organism. But more important, probably, is you also destroy its ability to repair itself. So ultimately, that's where you get your sterilization from. So all the biological processes are being stopped. This whole list of uh, guidance documents, various ISO standards and AMI standards, and the, the lead-in, uh, the follow-on ones that are TIRs, all of them are the same. But I do want you to focus on the last one. TIR 104 is very, very new. It was just released a few months ago. It was written specifically to give more detailed information about the process of converting from one energy to another or moving from one ir physical irradiator to another. Um, this, the original standards, the 11137 series, have fantastic information. It's held up great for decades. But when they get to some of these things that didn't used to happen very often, they kind of stop. They say what you want, they want you to do, but they don't really help you figure out how to do that. That additional document has been very well received uh, globally as a good guidance document. Okay, when you're comparing, there will be differences between X-ray and ga uh, gamma. That energy level, 1.25 average on gamma, a broad spectrum in X-ray as high as about seven to seven and a half. The, um, the what is penetrating, it's still, the photo, it's a photon either way, whether it came from gamma or X-ray, but that energy level is a different energy level photon. Uh, dose rate, X-ray will be faster, so it will deliver the same amount of kilograms of dose in a much shorter period of time. Uh, temperature, when you irradiate anything, you have to assume bonds are breaking, so that at some level, the temperature inside your product will be at least something higher than ambient. In gamma, you have this long period of time where it's in the radiator, it's maybe getting a little warmer, it's dissipating heat, but we know from years and years of what products are made out of, it never gets high enough to cause damage to most products. Um, in X-ray, those exposures to the ionizing radiation are much shorter. So you have periods of time where it's not being ionized. So in, in theory, the total amount of degrees of exposure the product will see should be much less. Um, exposure time, because it's faster, is a shorter time. And because you can use the pallets rather than the carriers, you don't have to do any additional work. Okay? You can do, in, in x-ray, in order to get the best uniformity of dose, you can do multiple passes. This is an example of a system that can do four passes where they do it in two layers, so they go up top and bottom. But you can even, on a single layer, you can do it where you turn the pallet and do another pass. When you transfer, these are the key things that do come up in conversation and you would be expected to address. The, what the effect it would have on the minimum dose, that's the one we told you would probably be the least of concern. The max, what do you need to know about your product's performance? What will the max dose be affected by? 
Um, no matter what you do in radiation, if you change the irradiator you use, you are doing a new dose map for it. And the one thing that will be unique to x-ray in our systems will be you will have to adjust something called activation. What we want you to do, or what is the ideal thing for most people to do, and makes the most sense, is look at the, some of the critical things you know about what's happening here and see whether they're a risk to your product. And what you'll find is most of them are not, or they're very low risk, because you're going photon to photon. But there are solutions to making the assessments. And you will see many papers, especially there's one addressed in here that was written and published through BPSA that you can get online for free. Um, was a consortium a document where many people in the industry and the users and producers worked together to address how one would approach changing. And they looked at things and said, well, first off, you have to have a plan. Write the plan. Document in your plan what you're going to assess and why you chose those. Um, do testing side by side. Don't just test one thing, don't, you know, but com you're comparing x-ray to gamma. Do a gamma side by side with the x-ray. And if possible, the same exact lot of product. So you have as little variability as possible. Show yourself, show anybody else who you have to prove it to that the effect is the same. Um, know what you did with your gamma product. How did you decide to do whatever dose? How did you decide whatever max dose you had? Use that legacy information to guide you on what your risk would be and what parts of your, your profile that you looked at before are the places you want to most gather information on. Um, and then use publications, not as a replacement for st uh, doing testing, but to justify and support why you did that testing. And there's good levels of information. So when you're looking at x-ray versus gamma, higher dose rate for the x-ray, lower exposure time, means lower ionization time, less oxidation, in almost all cases leads to less changes in the materials. And that's usually where the limitation is in radiation processes. If you go too high, you may reach a point where you're doing damage to your product, not just sterilizing it. Um, always have a PQ map. You're, you are required to have a map to show that in that system you're running in, that that system can deliver the dose you need, do it repeatedly, and that it is capable of handling the volume, et cetera, that you need, so that you know what you're gonna present to that system whenever it comes, that you can get the result you need, and you can prove it. You'll look at the, D, the dose uniformity. Okay, the results of a PQ map are, what is your dose uniformity? What's that distribution of dose across that, that entire palette? Max divided by min is dose uniformity ratio. It tells you, did we achieve an acceptable dose uniformity? Usually means that it's less or equal to what the customer's previous spec was. You're measuring it, you have to have devices to measure it that are calibrated and reproducible. We have to have a system that can read those devices. Those are the dosimeters. The location in that, mat, that pallet where the max zone is and the min zone is, you have to know. Because you have to know that the distribution will now cover within that, that you will never go over your max and never below your min. Um, you want to evaluate all the dose data to make sure what you have is supported. And the results, if successful, will show that you now have a system where you can produce your product and do it repeatedly. Because when you do these maps, you never do them in isolation. You always do them at least three times. Okay? Mentioned activation. Activation means a doing something to a material that will raise the activation level higher than it was in nature. The important thing is that you don't raise the activation level higher than is safe. And there are limits specific to individual countries, regions, etc. We have done, we, we, Steris is very lucky. We've had an operational uh, uh, x-ray systems for more than 10 years in Switzerland. So we have a lot of data that shows the vast majority of materials 
don't show any significant activation on x-ray. Um, in the United States, we've had an operational lower volume system in our radiation technology center in Libertyville that also can do that activation testing. That paper that's listed at the bottom is part of a compendium series of articles that is also free from Amy, and it has an excellent article that explains what activation is and how you measure it. Um, why do we even need x-ray? It's not just because it's, it's cool to play with. Like the guy who said one, on one of the early days, he said, um, this is a great time to be in healthcare in every aspect, but you, know, you get good toys to play with and you get to work with a, lots of, a lot of smart people. That's what we, all, we should all achieve in our, our careers. And in, in x-ray, we're doing this for a reason, not just because x-ray will work, because, but because it's needed. The growth in healthcare across the world has become, if you start looking at the curve over years, we as an industry in terminal sterilization have to be able to handle that growth. And we have to build for it before it is here. There are numerous studies that were um, published or people purchased. And one good example is also, this graph comes from, is in the um, BPS paper I mentioned earlier. The important thing, and you can't see the little bitty pieces on here, because I know I can't and I'm all closer to it. Where that red line is, that arrow, that's 2022 to 2023. Guess where we are right now? We're in almost October of 2022. So this projection where that green line is going, that's growth. The blue line is how fast cobalt 60 can grow. The, there's a gap between those two lines, which means on that same trajectory, the dependence we have on gamma cannot can be completely or easily achieved. Now, why is the gap there? Well, first off, they can't make enough cobalt fast enough, and it decays. So when you, you can't buy it in advance and store it to meet the projected needs. But there's more pressures than just that. Worldwide, people want to move away from radioactives. There's encouragement from regulatory agencies, from government bodies, just from safety where people are afraid of using, being dependent on radioactives. You also have to build the systems. A radioactive system is a much more difficult thing to build and takes much longer and has many more uh, regulatory requirements to keep it operational. Um, and if you build it, where are you going to get the cobalt to put in it, to use it? Because remember also, cobalt decaying means it's got to be replaced and, or supplemented every year to keep it working effectively. But what kind of alternatives would there be? What does the alternative have to do? Well, it has to be something with that processing potential. Okay, X-ray will do that. It needs to be able to grow as fast as all of the industries are. Yep, it can do that. And it has to be, and more, the most important, is it has to provide the continuity for industry and for healthcare needs. Okay. There's a lot of ionizing radiations, but ultimately the one that's going to meet that need is going to be X-ray. So, I mean, the big question always, uh, you know, you hear all this, you know, oh my gosh, we have to do something. Yes, you do. But is X-ray, the viability of it, is it an addition, either a good addition or alternate to gamma? And the resounding answer is yes. It's photon-based, so it has the penetration. It's non-radioactive, so you don't have to replenish a source every year. You can turn it off if times are slow and not lose anything. If you, tr you don't use a gamma radiator, the cobalt just decays. You lose it. It produces a constant rate over the time the product is passing the scan horn. Um, in gamma, you're moving, through the, uh, you're moving around the maze, uh, around the source rack, at different distances from the source. So you have multiple rates, but the cumulative dose is the correct one. Um, you can process on pallets easily. You, um, you also are at a perfect time in the advancement of science in that old, old x-ray systems were not very, they didn't have very high power, they weren't very resilient, they, they didn't hold up really well, they, they couldn't be depended on as well. Now the systems are much better and also the, um, the carrier systems 
to bring the product in the um, position it needs to be to be rated at are much better, much faster, and much more reliable. Um, the effects of all the good and the bad of x-ray we've basically hit on. And the, the, probably the biggest barrier for most people to even look at this was they thought of it as a novel technology. It is not. It is traditional. It's an ionizing radiation source treated by regulatory agency as an ionizing radiation source. Okay. We're not going to watch the video, I hope, but we do want to look at the slide. The video, I, I, I suggest you go look at Steris' YouTube site. It's there. It's what you can see as a brand spanking new modern x-ray system and see what we can do with one now that we couldn't do a decade ago. These articles that are mentioned cover the microbiological effectiveness. They cover the, what's a photon? What are the, are the photons different? And also more and more papers focusing on the transition between converting your systems or adding to your system from gamma to x-ray. Okay. So you consider the minimum dose support. The best way that probably do that is do a dose audit with your current verification dose. Do your new PQ map, because you have to, it's a new irradiator. Confirm your maximum allowable dose as is, is acceptable. Then design your path, a full pass document, how you're going to evaluate what is critical to your system. And make sure you test for activation at your maximum allowable dose, at least in the beginning, so you know what your materials effects are in terms of activation. Um, I thank you for your patience. I thank you for having, being really patient to have to listen to this um, very quickly. But I, we will, I, I'm still here. Steris' booth is right here. <laughs> it's 740. We'd be pleased to answer any questions you have. And more often, the more you think about it, that's when the questions will happen. And you'll have my contact information. And feel free to call anytime. Thank you.